Thank you. So our final paper today will be delivered by Dr. Jeremy Johns, who is the director of the Khalili Research Center for the Art and Material Culture of the Middle East and professor of the Art and Archaeology of the Islamic Mediterranean at Oxford University. He is principally interested in relations among Muslim and Christian societies in the medieval Mediterranean as manifested in their material and visual culture. His research focuses on Sicily under Islamic and Norman rule. Professor Johns has published a monograph, Arabic Administration in Norman Sicily, which came out with Cambridge in 2002, as well as more than 80 articles on the art, archaeology, and history of the Islamic Mediterranean, ranging from analyses of the transition from late antiquity to Islam in the Levant, and discussions of the beginnings of Islamic art and material culture, to detailed studies of the state structures and buildings of the Normans of Sicily. He has excavated sites on, in Sicily and Jordan and continues to publish reports on these excavations. Recently, he also contributed a 250,000 word analysis to the first comprehensive study of the painted, ceiling of, painted ceilings of the Norman Capella Palatina in Palermo. He is currently working on a new critical edition of the Arabic documents of Norman Sicily and also serves as the co-director of a new online corpus of inscriptions from ancient North Arabia. Today, Professor Johns will be speaking to us about the role of royal courts in the mobility of artists and the transfer of technology within the Fatimid Mediterranean. His talk is entitled Fatimid Fustat and Norman Palermo. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Johns. Thank you, Abigail, uh, for that generous introduction and for organizing this fascinating day. Now, when I wrote the abstract for this paper back in December 2014, I thought that it would focus on the image of Cairo Fustat that is reflected in the distorting mirror of Norman Palermo. But a year later, I find that this paper is in fact, as Abigail has said, about the role of royal courts in the mobility of artists and the transfer of technologies in the Fatimid Mediterranean. And of course, this is not a new theme for Fustat. All of us know versions of the story, some of us may even believe one of them, of how <laughs> the technique of luster painting on ceramics began with the stains containing silver and copper that were applied to glass during the 8th century or earlier in Egypt and Syria. The earliest piece known from Fustat, incidentally, in the Museum of Islamic Art in Cairo, which I cannot illustrate, bears an inscription with the year 163, that's 779 to 780 in our calendar. From glass, the technique of luster painting was transferred to white glazed ceramics, almost certainly by entrepreneurs of Basra in Iraq during the 9th century. For obvious reasons, the evidence from Basra is rather stale and leaves much to be desired. But there's good reason to think that it was the technique of luster painting on glass that transferred from Egypt or Syria to Basra and was there adapted to decorate the opaque white glazed wares that had recently been developed as a response to Chinese imports. There's considerable overlap between the designs on luster-decorated glass from Basra and luster-painted ceramics. Significantly, all Abbasid lustered ceramics were painted on a single highly characteristic clay body that has convincingly been attributed to Basra. And moreover, the variation in style and quality of luster painting on Abbasid ceramics is very limited when compared to the vast range of styles and qualities exhibited in the decoration of opaque white glazed wares as a whole. So as Oliver Watson and others have suggested, this does seem to argue for some sort of coordinated monopolistic production 
of luster painted glass and ceramics in 9th century Basra. Now the question of who might have been behind such a monopoly is unanswerable on the evidence now available. But if, as Hugh Kennedy has been suggesting for years, the development of property, of urban property in Samara, was largely driven by speculative investment by the leading ministers of the court and officers of the army, then I'm tempted to suggest that the venture capitalists in contemporary Basra may have belonged to the same class. You will see later what leads me to that hypothesis, and you'll also pick up that I'm bouncing um, ideas, or Marina and I are bouncing ideas about um, the Fatimid pre-industrial state off each other at this point. Now, at some time in the late 10th century, luster-painted ceramics ceased to be made in Iraq, and at just about the same time, they began to be made in Fustat. And in the mid to late 12th century, luster painted ceramics ceased to be produced in Fustat, and the technique spread north to Syria and east to Kashan in Iran. And the point of this being that luster painting on ceramics, which requires that the white glazed vessels, after they have been fired for the first time, must be painted with metallic pigments and then fired a second time at a lower temperature in a specialized kiln with a reducing atmosphere to fix the copper and the silver pigments, that is a technique that can't be learned from the objects themselves and so can only have been spread by the migration of potters from Basra in the 10th century to Fustat and thence to Syria and Kashan during the 12th century. Incidentally, while luster painting, sorry, while luster painted, while luster painted ceramic objects were exported from Iraq to Aglabidifrikia in the mid 9th century, for example, the tiles surrounding the mihrab in the great mosque of Al Kairawan, which bizarrely were sent as part of a relief package from the Abbasids to the Aglabids after an earthquake, just what you need. <laughs> While luster painted objects such as these were exported from Iraq to the Maghrib, the technique of luster painting doesn't seem to have spread west of Egypt until the mid 13th century, when luster painted ceramics first began to be produced in Malaga. In Sicily, Finds of imported Fatimid lusterware are extremely rare. I dare say that they're more frequent in the port cities of North Italy than they are in Palermo. And the technique of luster painting never spread to Sicily during the Middle Ages. Now, while the fact that the technique of luster painting on ceramics moved about in this way is accepted by all. There's no agreement as to the factor or factors that drove potters to migrate, carrying the technique with them. Civil disorder, first in Iraq and then in Egypt, that meant security for the potters and disrupted their markets, the rise and fall of the bourgeois consumers of luster-painted ceramics, religious preference that attracted the Shi'i potters of Iraq to Egypt after the arrival of the Fatimids and then drove them elsewhere after the takeover by the Sunni Salahuddin, and of course, the rise and fall of the Abbasid and Fatimid court, all of these have been proposed to explain the migration of luster painting potters from the 10th to the 13th century, but there's little or no evidence to support any single hypothesis and no real consensus. There is, however, abundant archeological evidence that luster painted ceramics were distributed so widely through the social structure in Egypt and Syria that they cannot be regarded as a luxury item produced exclusively for the court. This ware was mass produced for sale on the market and carried reflections of the court into the houses of not just the urban middle classes, but even the wealthier peasantry in rural villages. Dynastic change itself 
cannot, therefore, have been the sole factor in the migration of potters to and from Fustat. Nonetheless, the chronological coincidence between the rise and fall of Abbasid between the rise and fall of the Abbasid and the Fatimid courts and the transfer of luster painting potters does suggest that the two processes were in some way connected. And that what keeps us from understanding precisely how this was so is the lack of evidence for all aspects of the ceramic industry, which is notoriously absent from the written sources. And for which we still have remarkably little archaeological evidence compared, for example, to the mass of data that we have for Roman imperial fine tablewares. And another factor, of course, is the continuing reluctance of those of us who study early Islamic material culture to produce the sort of detailed catalogues of artifacts upon which our Romanist colleagues, for example, can rely. Of the tens of thousands of pieces of known Fatimid lusterware, only two carry inscriptions indicating that they were made in Fustat in the circle of the court in Cairo. But while this seems to confirm that luster painted pottery was indeed mass produced for the market and not a luxury item manufactured for the court, it is striking that both inscriptions name ministers or officials of some kind at the court of Al-Hakim, about whom we heard this morning. Could it be that Al-Hassan Akbar Al-Hakimi and the master of master, the Qaid of Qaid Zraban, were venture capitalists who invested the wealth that they had accumulated while holding high office in the luster-painted pottery industry? The signature of the piece on the left, Muslim, with or without the patronymic al-Dahan, literally son of the painter, is found on more than 40 pieces of lusterware, but in such a variety of different scripts and formulae that they cannot all have been written by a single hand. Perhaps, as Marilyn Jenkins suggested, he gave his name to a workshop, and if so, then the survival of more than 40 pieces with the same mark may indicate that it was an enterprise of significant size and importance. Al-Hassan Iqbal may have invested in quite a substantial business. Now, this is a convenient moment to note in passing that the lovely little rock crystal you are in the Palazzo Pitti, now restored and back on display after its adventures, it was dropped, bears the inscription Likaid al Qawad Khasatan for the Qaid of Qaids personally or, or privately. David Storm Rice had no hesitation in identifying the bearer of this title as Abu Abdullah al Hussein, the son of the great Jauha Asikali, Jauha the Sicilian, who was given, um, the son who was given this title by the Caliph al Hakim and used it between the 25th of May 1000 and the 18th of April 1008. But as we've just seen, exactly the same title was used by his contemporary Rabban, so that Rice's identification cannot be taken for granted. And I'll be getting in touch with Marina to see if that particular title appears on that list of titles from the Geniza that she referred to this morning. Be that as it may, could the appearance of this title on a rock crystal ewer indicate that its bearer, whoever he was, had invested in the rock crystal industry? In Fustat, not just as a customer, but also as an entrepreneur. I ask not because I know the answer, but because I want you to keep that sort of question in mind as we move on. For I must turn now to consider the relationship between Fatimid Fustat and Norman Palermo, which is comparatively well documented, both in the written sources and by material evidence. Here, I suggest we have almost a laboratory in which we can compare and contrast multiple examples of the migration of artists and the transfer of techniques from Fatimid Fustat 
to Norman Palermo, and thereby perhaps learn more about the nature of the processes involved. And that comparison, in turn, may help us to understand better the fragmentary evidence from Fustat. Well, to set the scene, I'm going to begin with a chronological outline, which is going to have some um, diversions in the middle of it, before moving on to a series of quick case studies. Palermo was conquered by an army from Aglomi di Frecchia in 831, and thereafter it remained under Muslim rule until it was conquered by the Normans in January 1072. For the first 150 years, there's almost no evidence of contact between Muslim Palermo and Fustad. And Palermo was far more closely connected to Ifriqiya than it was to any other part of the Islamic Mediterranean. The defeat of the Aglabids by the Fatimids did nothing to change this, and it is only with the migration of the Fatimids to Egypt and the foundation of Cairo that we begin to have evidence for direct relations between Palermo and Cairo Fustat. And the bulk of the evidence is of two kinds. First, as Paul Walker told us this morning, relations between the courts of Cairo and Palermo. Before their migration, the Fatimids had entrusted Sicily to an Arab family, the Kelbids, whereas they had left Ifriqiya in the hands of the Berber dynasty of the Zirids. Although contacts between the Kelbids of Palermo and the Zirids of Ifriqiya remained close, the Kelbids tended to play their Fatimid overlords against their Zirid neighbors. And so a particularly close relationship developed between the courts of Cairo and Palermo. All of our evidence is literary and anecdotal. None is documentary or material. Members of the Kelbid family were frequent visitors to Cairo. And whenever there was a political crisis in Sicily, the Fatimids <coughs> intervened. Now, the second kind of evidence comes from the correspondence of the Geniza merchants. Approximately 160 published Geniza documents relate to Sicily. None is earlier than the migration of the Fatimids to Egypt. Approximately 140, that is 90%, date from the period before the Norman conquest of Palermo in 1072. It's tempting, therefore, to conclude that the close contacts between the Fatimid and the Kelbid courts account for the presence of Geniza merchants in Sicily. But it's important to remember that the Geniza documents can't really be used in this manner. In statistical terms, the documents represent nothing more than the random processes of deposition in the Geniza and the survival thereafter and cannot be used as representative indicators of the volume of trade and other contacts between Fustat and Palermo. And this is illustrated by the fact that two thirds of the Geniza documents relating to Sicily come from the period between the fall of the unified Kelbids Emirate in circa 1040 and the capture of Palermo by the Normans 30 years later, a period of intense economic, political, and social disorder in both Ifriqiya and Sicily, which clearly had a negative impact upon the business of the Geniza community. The high number of documents from this period seems to reflect three things above all, not the high volume of trade. First, the fact that the correspondence of a small number of merchants and their families and associates who were active in Sicily at this time was regularly deposited in the Geniza. Second, that during this period of intense disruption in Ifriqiya, the route along the North African coast was frequently interrupted. Several documents say so. So that more commerce than usual passed directly between Egypt and Sicily. And third, that the civil and economic disruption in both Ifriqiya and Sicily caused the Geniza merchants to write to each other with, infre with increasing frequency and growing sense of panic in order to keep abreast of the latest developments in a rapidly changing economic and security environment. The last Kelbid ruler was expelled in 1052 to 53. 
and fled to Cairo. A year or so later, the Zirids in Ifriqiya began again to acknowledge Fatimid rule, and from 1062, after the Norman invasion in the east of the island, the Zirids attempted to rule Sicily directly from Palermo. But in 1068 to 69, the Normans began to encircle Palermo, and the Zirids wisely withdrew, leaving the Sicilians to their fate. The Geniza correspondence relating to Sicily, the volume of which reached a peak in the early 1060s, ends abruptly in 1069. And I'm now going to do exactly what I've just said it is not legitimate to do. And although David Abalafia has taken me to task for doing so, because so sharp and so sudden is the cessation of Geniza correspondence that I'm inclined to attribute it to the Norman siege of Palermo, which culminated in the conquest of the city in January 1072. So the correspondence stops 1069, maybe 1070. And the next Geniza document relating to Sicily dates from 1122, by which time we know the Fatimid and the Norman courts were already in direct contact. Thereafter, for the next 130 years, there's a mere trickle of Geniza correspondence, about 20 documents with no obvious pattern of distribution discernible. I stress these are the published documents. Lord knows what really is out there. Now, while I do think it likely that the resumption of the correspondence in 1122 reflects the rapprochement between the courts of Cairo and Palermo, I do not believe that the relatively low volume of Geniza correspondence thereafter, compared with the earlier period of Kelbid rule, is likely to reflect a decline in the volume of trade between Norman Palermo and Fustat. Nor even, although I suppose this is just about possible, a decline in the role played by Geniza or even by Jewish merchants in that trade. The rapprochement between Cairo and Palermo began during the reign of Al-Amir, whose administration took a close interest in the activity of South Italian merchants in Alexandria. Between 1114 and 1126, George of Antioch, who had been chief financial minister for the Zirids before he defected to Palermo in 1108, was dispatched I'm using Macrisi's words many times, as ambassador to Cairo. George was almost certainly an Armenian, and he enjoyed a particularly close relationship with Vahram Pahlavuni, the Armenian vizier of Al-Hafiz from 1135 to 1137. Because Vahram's uncle, Vasak Pahlavuni, the last Byzantine Duke of Antioch, had been served by George's father and his family before 1098. From 1126 until his death in 1151, George was the chief minister of Roger II, and we shall return to him repeatedly in the remainder of this talk. In July 1123, the Zirid Emir asked Al-Amir to intervene with Roger II. In other words, he already knew him well enough, or the relations between the courts were so close that um, there was some chance of that intervention working, to intervene with Roger II to persuade him to call off his assault against Ifriqiya. The Sicilians launched their disastrously unsuccessful naval attack on al Mahdiya in the very months that the Zirid ambassador arrived in Cairo. Subsequently, an embassy was dispatched from Cairo to Palermo, led by, another, by an otherwise unknown official whose honorific title, Mustaniya Adawla, um, the builder of the state, the maker of the state, suggests that he was a caliphal official of some importance. In 1130, Roger was crowned king of Sicily, and work began on the creation of the image of his monarchy, which was, from the outset, 
plan to be an ostentatious plan to be ostentatiously sorry let me try that again ostentatiously multicultural so as to demonstrate as the greek panegyricist eugenius of palermo was later to put it to demonstrate how the unifying power of the norman king would i quote harmonize the inharmonious and mix together the unmixable blending and uniting into a single race disparate and incongruent peoples. Fatimid Cairo and adjacent Fustat were the principal sources for the Islamic ingredients that went into the new multicultural monarchy. And I'll examine some examples of this from the 1130s and the 1140s when I come to my case studies in just a moment. Now, a key piece of evidence for relations between Cairo and Palermo is the one letter that survives from the correspondence between Al-Hafiz and Roger II. It dates from 1137 and is clearly at least the fourth letter to be exchanged between the two courts. Such royal letters were, of course, not entrusted to the post, but they were carried by embassies and accompanied by gifts. This letter from Al-Hafiz reassures Roger that the gifts that he had sent with his previous letter had arrived safely, had been checked against the inventory that accompanied the letter, and had been deposited in the Fatimid treasury. The letter goes on to introduce the ambassador, Abu Mansur Jaffa Al-Hafizi, and to report that a lift of the gifts entrusted to him for Roger was enclosed with the letter. But this list has sadly been lost. And we have to turn to something like the Book of Gifts and Rarities for examples of the sort of list that it must have been. And also, um, and I recommend this to anyone who hasn't caught up with it yet, although it uh, refers to a slightly later and I suspect a rather less generous age to Doris Abu Saif's um, now indispensable practicing diplomacy in the Mamluk Sultanate, an excellent read. Two further points are worth stressing about this letter. First, in the letter, Al-Hafiz thanks Roger for rescuing a ship called Al-Arus, the Bride, which had been, I quote, under the protection of Al-Hafiz's private diwan. The Bride had been captured by Sicilian ships and her cargo had been seized before the Sicilian commander realized the status of the ship. Once he realized that she was the caliph's own ship, the commander took her under his protection, restored her cargo, and sent her on her way with an escort. And the letter reports how to show his gratitude. Al-Hafiz granted exemption from import and export taxes at Alexandria and Cairo to any ship of the king, of George of Antioch, and, I quote, of the two ambassadors who are yet to arrive, and this may refer to an embassy from Salerno. In other words, the two rulers, George of Antioch, other ambassadors from the Norman kingdom, were all trading on their own behalf and enjoyed special tax exemptions while they were doing so. If only we knew what they were trading. Second, it's clear from the content of the letter that although the correspondence was ostensibly between the caliph and the king, the real correspondence were their viziers. The surviving letter of 1137 was evidently written from Cairo by the Sunni vizier Ridwan ibn al-Walakshi, who had been responsible for ousting from power his predecessor, the Armenian Vahram Pahlavoni who had clearly been the author of earlier letters in the exchange. Although addressed to Roger, the letter of 1137 was clearly intended for the eyes of his vizier, George of Antioch. It's clear from the letter that Roger, sorry, it's clear from the letter from, it is clear that the letter from Roger, to which this is the reply, had praised George at great length. And this letter, 
says diplomatically that great as George's qualities were, they were clearly merely reflections of the qualities of his master. In this letter, Ridwan expands upon his own outstanding virtues as if it was the caliph who was praising him. And at great length, more, um, the, the more words are spent on this than on any other subject in the letter, at great length he seeks to explain and to justify the fall from power into disgrace and exile of Vahram, George's fellow Armenian and old family connection. Now for me, this offers an unusually vivid glimpse into how such international relationships may actually have worked. While it's difficult to conceive of the Fatimid al-Hafiz and the Norman Roger ever having had much in common, and of course, they never actually met, it's easy to imagine George on one of his many visits to Cairo, sitting down with Vahram, or more probably with one of his Armenian predecessors, for a conversation that ranged from the weighty affairs of state to a good gossip about their Armenian acquaintances to an exchange of views on the practicalities of serving their respective masters. Meanwhile, we can imagine George's eunuchs and servants who accompanied him to Cairo, having supervised the unpacking of their master's gifts and the checking of the inventory, touring the Fatimid palace and treasury, gazing wistfully at a painted ceiling, a rock crystal ewer, a fine piece of carved woodwork, and agreeing that this was exactly what they needed in Palermo. It seems to me that we can learn more and it seems to me that the more we can learn about such ministers and their servants, the closer we come to understanding what must have been the real operation of cultural exchange between the courts of the Fatimid Mediterranean. Now, the deaths of Al-Hafiz, of George of Antioch, and of Roger II between 1149 and 1154 brought an end to the close relations between Cairo and Palermo and the collapse of the Fatimid Caliphate in the 1160s ensured that they would never be revived. The Sicilians do seem to have attempted to install a Fatimid pretender to Cairo in 1174, when they unsuccessfully attacked Alexandria, as they did again in 1175-6. While this came to nothing, it does demonstrate, I think, how close the alliance between Fatimid Cairo and Norman Palermo had been. Now, in Sicily, the succession crisis that followed the death of William II in 1189 began a period of civil war and Muslim rebellion that culminated with the conquest of, this, of the island by the German Emperor Henry VI in 1194. Although Henry was married to Roger's daughter, Constance, he rapidly set about dismantling what remained of the multicultural monarchy created by her father. He wanted everything in Latin. When Henry died unexpectedly in 1197, his widow Constance began to restore her father's multicultural kingdom, but she herself died too soon to achieve anything lasting. And her son, Frederick II, attempted rather half-heartedly, I have to say, to return to his grandfather's golden age, but the threat to his kingdom posed by the prolonged rebellion of the Muslims of Sicily, frustrated all such designs. Now, after that rather lengthy chronological review, I come to a series of quick case studies of artists and technologies on the move from Fatimid Fustat to Norman Palermo. First, I want to begin with a poet, the Egyptian poet Ibn Kalakis, who provides an extremely useful example of speculative patronage during interesting times, or perhaps I should say of a speculative search for patronage during interesting times. Born in Alexandria in 1137 and educated there, Ibn Kalakis moved to Cairo in the 1150s. There he addressed Qasidas to several members of the court, including the vizier Tala'i bin Rasik, and even to the caliph al-Adid himself. But by this time, 
the springs of Fertimid patronage were running dry. And for the last few years of his life, Ibn Kalakis was obliged to seek his fortune abroad. During the 1160s and 70s, he sought the support of a wide range of patrons, including Abd al-Mu'min, the al-Mohad, various figures in Sicily, including the regent Margaret and her young son William II, viziers in Aden and the Hadramaut, and even the pirate emir of the Dakhlak Islands. In desperation, he addressed a qasida to Salah Adin, but apparently without success. Now, I wish to draw three quick points from the example of Ibn Kalakis. First, his travels cluster between the early summer of 1168 and his death in 1172, and so coincide with the death throes of the Fatimid dynasty. This suggests that the failure of the springs of patronage in Cairo and possibly the threat from civil disorder was what led Ibn Kalakis to seek patronage elsewhere. It could even be that his early speculative approach to Abd al-Mu'min, the al-Mohad, which must date from the latter's death in the summer, before the latter's death in the summer of 1163, might have been prompted by the revolt of Shawa in November 1062, the event which drew both Nur ad-Din and Amalric of Jerusalem to intervene in Egypt. Second, the range of Ibn Kalakis' search for a patron during the last decade of his life, from 1063 to 10, um, to, from 1163 to 1172, is, I think, remarkable and illustrates the important point that the Fatimid court was the only great center of patronage in the Muslim West from the fall of the Umayyads of Spain until the rise of the Ayyubids. During the 12th century, as the Fatimids began to run out of resources, artists, poets, and scholars had to range widely in search of a patron. And third, we can see how Ibn Kalakis attempted to gain access to royal patrons by seeking first to attract the attention of their ministers and courtiers. In this way, he gained access to Al-Adid through his vizier Talai. As to Sicily, as early as 1160, Ibn Kalakis wrote speculative letters to two rival leaders of the Muslims in Sicily. The Sheikh al-Sadid, who is called by one Latin source the most wealthy of the Saracens of Sicily, and the Qaid Abu al-Qasim Muhammad ibn Hamoud, hereditary leader of the Muslim community under Norman rule and an officer in the Norman court. This groundwork eventually paid off, and in 1168, Abu al-Qasim invited Ibn Kalakis to Palermo. And there, he assiduously cultivated the members of the literary circle around Abu al-Qasim, which included the Qaid Richard, the leading crypto-Muslim eunuch in the Norman palace. Abu uh, in the Norman palace, where am I? Abu Sa'id who may be either another royal official or, I suspect, the Arabic name um, of uh, the eunuch Richard. Abu Said presented Ibn Kalakis to the regent Margaret and her young son, William II. And Ibn Kalakis dedicated two Qasidas to his royal patrons and one to the eunuch Richard. On his departure, he received a generous viaticum from the court including, rather bizarrely, barrels of tuna fish. <laughs> but it was Abu al-Qasim who rewarded him so richly in gold that he was able to afford to complete the pilgrimage to the holy places. Now, a man of letters like Ibn Kalakis is likely to have joined, to enjoyed a far greater degree of freedom in his choice of patron than any artist or artisan. While he could approach a patron himself, especially one of ministerial rank, with some hope of success, it's difficult to imagine that a mere artisan could have done the same. He would either have had to await an invitation, or, still less independent, he would have been dispatched by one patron as a gift to another. And this is exactly what seems to have happened in my next two case studies. Thus, in 1198, 
Sorry, something's gone wrong there. Um, I've uh, shown um, in uh, my book, Arabic Administration, how after the creation of the Norman Kingdom in 1130, the remnants of the old um, Arabic administration uh, that had been inherited from the Kelvins were completely reformed um, by George of Antioch, who was head of that administration, by importing scribes, scripts, diplomatic forms and diplomatic formulae, um, uh, bureaucratic offices, structures, and procedures from the contemporary Diwan of uh, Fatimid Cairo. And I'm showing you on the top the uh, trilingual Diwan and on the bottom the, the endowment charter of George's church that has um, up here at the top the alama of um, the official alama of King Roger, not written by Roger, I hasten to say. Now, um, these complicated technical matters, chancery structure, diplomatic form, and so on, I don't think were brought to Sicily on the objects themselves. I think they are brought by scribes, um, by secretaries, and um, who come to Sicily, migrate to Sicily, and there um, institute a, a living tradition that carries on for the years of Norman rule. But one of the striking features about it is that when they arrive, there was a flourishing indigenous um, documentary and scribal tradition attached to the Fatimid Qadis and his court. We have many of those documents. But there appears to be no contact whatsoever, no crossover between the imported, um, between the, the, the aspects that are imported to the Normandy one from the Fatimid Chancery and the indigenous Sicilian tradition. And that remains the case right the way through um, to the end. Thus, in 1198, after the secretaries of the Normandy One had been massacred in the pogroms of 1189 to 90, when Queen Constance attempted to restore her father's Arabic administration, her ministers had to look for models outside the island, just as George of Antioch had done 70 years earlier. And this is um, a new detail. The friendly Fatimids had long disappeared. Their Ayyubid successors were positively hostile, but somehow Constance's chancery found a scribe familiar with the Almohad diplomatic form known as the Zahir, and so they issued a document full of the overblown and pretentious literary language that's characteristic of the Almohad Zahir, but had never before appeared in the Arabic documents of the Norman Diwan. The third case study is, again, one on which I've written at some length, the painted ceiling of the nave of the Capella Palatina in Palermo. Recent work by Fabrizio Agnello, Lev Capitekin, and myself demonstrates that the ceiling is the work of an itinerant workshop of carpenters and painters who were trained in the traditions of the Islamic Mediterranean. Lev Capitekin, in particular, has shown that the painters um, were trained in the Egyptian tradition, presumably from Fustat. The coordinated manner in which they worked with the carpenters requires that the carpenters too had roots in Egypt, although the style of the Mokarnas indicates that they also drew upon a range of traditions, especially perhaps from the Almohad and the Almoravid West. A series of technical details demonstrates beyond doubt that the carpenters and painters had cooperated in the construction and decoration of ceilings of the same type before they arrived in Palermo. For example, the carpenters who built the ceiling knew to instruct the masons who built the walls of the nave exactly where to position the slots for the beams that support the ceiling and exactly where to place the crucial ventilation slits that have allowed it to survive for 900 years despite the dramatic variations in temperature between its inner and outer surfaces. Again, the painters knew how to organize Again, the painters knew how to organize a chain of production 
to complete their work as efficiently and quickly as possible. Here, after damage and restoration, we can see the remains of some of the preliminary sketches done by the painters in red of very simple circles and ellipses to give the positions of the figures that were then gone over in black and then filled in color and then given detail. And the painters brought with them a series of standard iconographic formulae, perfectly adapted to the most awkwardly shaped panels in the Mukarnas. For example, these tricky spoon-shaped panels were again and again filled with the same pair of musicians separated by a tree of life. And yet again, although most of the ceiling had to be painted in situ, the carpenters and painters devised a method whereby the most awkward elements of the central section of the ceiling, certainly these pendant stalactite bosses and possibly the hemispherical cupolas between them, could be decorated on the ground by the painters before they were hoisted up and fixed into place by the carpenters. And see here in the detail how the paint drips upwards because this was painted on the ground upside down. Now, such techniques could not have been learned from mere observation of similar ceilings, of course, but only by long experience. The coordinated workshops of painters and carpenters responsible for the ceiling of the Capella Palatina had made many such ceilings before they came to Palermo. The only thing that's unique about the ceiling is that it has survived. Just as the mosaicists who decorated the sanctuary of the Capella Palatina must have been summoned to Palermo from Constantinople by King Roger's ministers, or just possibly were dispatched on the order of the ministers of John Komnenos, so the workshop that made the ceiling must also have been summoned or possibly dispatched. It's almost unthinkable that like Ibn Kalakis, they could themselves have made a speculative approach to Palermo. And next year, in a colleague's Feshrift, I am going to publish a new study. Um, I should say yet another new study after the recent excellent work by Alicia Walker and Scott Redford, a new study of the um, hall in the Great Palace in Constantinople that was given in the 13th century the name of the Mohrutas by Nicholas Messerites. Contrary to the prevailing view, that holds that this hall was a pavilion in the Seljuk style, I've been able to find new um, etymological evidence and new topographical evidence to suggest that the building was the basilical hall, generally known as the Losiacus, built, um, built in the seventh century by Justinian II, extensively refurbished by Manuel Comnenos, who replaced the old coffered wooden ceiling with, I suggest, a new painted wooden Makarna ceiling made in all probability by the workshop that had worked in the Capella Palatina. And if I'm right, and of course I think I am, then this workshop that seems to have originated in Fustat was summoned or dispatched first to Palermo and then went on to Constantinople. This search for a patron as the Fatimid source of patronage runs dry. Here again, I think George of Antioch plays a key role. Recent work by Maria Aconcha Longo and others has shown that contrary to what was previously thought, George's church, Santa Maria della Miraglio, predates the Capella Palatina. If that's right, then many of the most characteristic features of the royal art and architecture of Norman Sicily appear for the first time in George's church. The mosaics that cover the walls and the vaults, Arabic inscriptions carved in stone and stucco and even painted on wood beneath the feet of the angels there, opus sectile floors and dados, and as we'll see in a moment, woodwork carved in the Fatimid style, not to mention those two most potent images of royal authority, that of King Roger, crowned by Christ, and throughout the church, the deliberate juxtaposition of architectural and decorative elements drawn from a variety of cultures, precisely to demonstrate how this king's authority, derived directly from God himself, would harmonize the inharmonious and mix together the unmixable. <laughs> 
My next case study, and I may well um, end with this one, is rock crystal, and in particular, the Saint-Denis Ewer in the Louvre. Whether or not this really is the La Gena Pre Clara that is mentioned by Abbot Suger, that had been given to Saint-Denis by Count Thibault of Blois-Champagne, who had himself been given it by Roger II of Sicily, and I think it must be, but I'm not going to press that. Whether or not it was may not matter, because the granulation on the lid is consistent with work on the regalia of the Norman kings of Sicily, so that it is generally accepted as evidence that this ewer passed through the kingdom of Sicily and there acquired its lid. Analyses of the carving of the ewer recently carried out by my colleague Elise Morero and myself show that the ewer was originally carved in a manner that left microscopic traces that are identical with those found on the other six surviving ewers from the group made in Fustat around the year 1000. But the same analyses have shown that this ewer was subsequently reworked using a similar set of tools which were applied in a manner inconsistent with the rest of the group. First, at some point, the handle has been damaged and broken here. The damage was tidied up, but in the empty area that would originally have been covered up by the bottom of the handle, a little palmette has been added. While the decoration of the group as a whole is always carved in relief, this secondary palmette, as you can see, is carved in taglio, a knot in relief. And we're awaiting the repair of the confocal rue Gosimita in Lyon to um, carry out the analyses of the carving of the palmette. But the second anomaly of this ewer involves the dots that delineate the edge of the wing of the falcon here. And yeah, I, can you see what I was talking about, about the griffin? I mean, there, there's, there's something there. All of the seven ewers in this Fatimid group employ similar dots, and all are made using the same tool, the drill bit with an ovoidal or spherical point, which leaves the characteristic traces that you can see here in plan um, from the Francis Mill ewer that's present in Lone and Dallas, and um, on the Fermont ewer. And there you can see in section deep concave um, impressions. But subsequently, all of the dots on, on the, um, the Sundany ewer were made in this way originally. But subsequently, some of them, and only some of them, were recarved using not a drill, but a rotary cutting wheel. Unlike the palmette under the handle, this wasn't a repair, and the recarving was done on decoration that was intact and perfect. Now, it's relatively easy to make dots with a spherical drill, drill bit, but it's extraordinarily difficult to make dots with the edge of a cutting disc, some two millimeters wide at maximum. And what's more, the recarved dots, as you can see, are irregular in plan, and I don't know if you can see there, they are marred by um, grooves and scratches made by the wheel, and they're much shallower than the traditional dots of the ewers made in Fustat. And this poses a puddle, a puzzle that we cannot yet give, um, to which we cannot yet give a confident answer. One possibility is that the recarving was carried out as an experiment by an inexperienced craftsman who was uncertainly, unsteadily trying to work out for himself how to carve a rock crystal ewer in the manner of Fustat. Where that experienced craftsman might have worked cannot yet be said, but both Norman Sicily and Capetian, and Capetian Paris could be candidates. Some years ago, Avinoam suggested that this lion's head in Karlsruhe might have been made in Norman Sicily. We haven't yet analyzed this piece, nor the one or two other pieces that share features in common with it. But even so, it evidently exhibits features that are not part of the Fatimid group. <laughs>
were we to accept that this was carved in Norman Sicily, and while we're in an accepting mode that the recarving of the Saint Denis Ewer was also done in Sicily, then we would have to conclude that the highly specialized technique of carving rock crystal had been transferred to Sicily not by expert lapidary craftsmen from Fustat, but by inexperienced craftsmen, or even by word of mouth, and then developed by trial and error. And for me, this is rather more than I'm prepared to accept, at least at the moment. To me, this looks like a completely different tradition of hard stone carving, which we are as yet unable to identify or locate. Now, I'm going to skip my final case study, which was the carved wood um, from Palermo, these doors from George of Antioch's church, um, with the soffit above the doors, and um, there's in detail the panels of the door, and also this uh, uh, lintel and um, jams um, from, uh, also from somewhere near George's church. And I'm not going to say anything either about this carved um, panel from, allegedly, from a ceiling within the, um, within the Norman palace. The reason I'm not doing this is because um, this was an example of a non-specialized technique. Wood carving is practiced all over the Mediterranean. And what's moving around here isn't the technique of wood carving, but it's the style in which the wood is carved. And I just want to make the point that, uh, I just put these in here to make the point that this isn't perhaps the most useful sort of um, evidence on which to work. Now, I've ranged far too widely to come to any neat conclusion. And so I'd like to emphasize a point that I made in the first half of this talk, which seems to me to connect especially with Marina Rustow's reconstruction of the Fatimid state. Marina was careful to insist that this was not a totalitarian state. And it seems to me that the way in which Al-Hafiz and Roger II, George of Antioch and the other ministers and officers of their pre-industrial states certainly participated directly in trade, and just may have provided the venture capital that financed industries such as the lusterware and the rock crystal industries. And at least in the case of George of Antioch, ministers who directly commissioned major building and artistic enterprises for their masters. It seems to me that these are examples of the sort of structures that we need to be looking for in these non-totalitarian states around the Mediterranean. I don't want to give the impression that Norman Sicily was anything like as centrally organized and as well organized as the Fatimid state was. It wasn't. It was a pale imitation of the Fatimid state. In Norman Sicily, things happened more by chance than by deliberate organization. If George of Antioch hadn't um, defected, or his father hadn't defected from um, Byzantium to Ziri di Frichia, if George hadn't defected from Ifrichia to Palermo, I doubt whether any of this would have happened. The in role of the individual in all of this seems to me to be absolutely crucial. And I come back to the opening phrase of Gombrich's The Story of Art. There's no such thing as the history of art. There's only the history of artists. And I think the history of artists and their patrons, I would add to this. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>